as a church, we've been journeying this Lent through the Gospel of Luke, to doing it, reading it together, studying it together. And we've come to the passage that represents today, that marks this day, Palm Sunday. The day we remember and celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, which marks the beginning of what this Holy Week, the week that leads Christ to the cross. So everything we've read about in the gospel is kind of leading up to this. This is the climax. This is, what's, this is where everything's been leading up to. And, and we can say that everyone back in those times was expecting a showdown in Jerusalem. Jesus has been bringing the message of God's view, uh, God's message of God's love and grace to the people in such a powerful way. And people have been observing his many miracles and his teachings. They've learned, listened in rapture to the stories about the way of Christ, the way of God, the principles to live by, and the parables that tell such compelling truths for the masses. Yet his teachings and his actions have not gone over very well for a group of people in those days, the ones that see Jesus as a political threat, a religious heretic. So on the first Palm Sunday, everyone seems to be have this foreboding that something's going to happen this week. All eyes are on Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey, not as a royal king, but as a, humbly as a donkey on a donkey the sh and to the shouts of praises for him. Hallelujah, Hosanna. Today they're singing God's his Jesus praises. But in about five days, they'll be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. This kind of paints the picture of Palm Sunday. Yet after Palm Sunday comes Monday. And Jesus kind of stirs up the pot some more. He steps into confrontation that eventually leads to his crucifixion. He's riled up about what is happening in his temple. And in so doing, he riles up the powers that, that be in the religious ruling class. So let's take a look at that scripture for the, for the morning. That touches on the events of Palm Sunday and the day after his arrival into the temple. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of Jew disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So before I talk about what happened in that temple on, on that Monday, let me give you some background about the temple itself. We cannot overstate the importance of this temple to ancient Judaism. Ancient Jews believe that the temple in Jerusalem was literally the center of the universe because the one place where heaven and earth intersect. Now, even though they didn't actually believe that, strictly believe that God resided in the temple, they believed God's presence was in the temple in a very special and unique way. They also viewed the temple as the only place where a person could find forgiveness of their sins, and they would come to this place to have sacrifices offered for the forgiveness of their sins. The temple was this magnificent structure. It sat on top of, of the Temple Mount or Mount Moriah. Yet more than being just a single structure, it was a campus. It was a complex with multiple structures surrounded by vast courtyards. The entire campus of the temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' time covered about 35 acres. It soared roughly 15 stories above the valley. And the purpose of the temple was to be a holy place a place to offer sacrifices for this forgiveness of sins, a place to worship, a place for prayer. And this was the time of Passover, the annual Jewish feast commemorating and celebrating the liberation of the uh, Jews from Egyptian slavery. And people traveled great distances to worship in Jerusalem during Passover. The temple was called Herod's Temple, but only because Herod was the one that built it. And he hoping to gain favor with the Hebrew people, Herod had built it. Looking over the history of the Hebrew people in the temple in Jerusalem, there are actually three versions of the temple. And this is, the Herod's temple is the last, the third and the last. As I said earlier, the temple was not just one structure, but a series of structures and open courts. The, the temple campus was surrounded by a wall, and a portion of that wall still exists, and it's called the Wailing Wall. There were a variety of gates that opened into courtyards. The vast courtyard around the middle structure itself was known as the Courtyard of the Gentiles. 
This is what had been turned into like a flea market, a bazaar, vendors selling souvenirs, sacrificial animals being sold, as well as currency changers. This is the area that kind of touched the hot button with Jesus when he saw what was going on there. The inner temple is where the Jews would meet the priests and offer animals for sacrifice and to worship. As they entered the temple itself, the inner structure, one would walk up these 14 steps to the beautiful gates. And once inside the beautiful gate, there was other courts where, whose names indicate who could enter those areas, like the, the court of women, the court of men. The innermost area was known as the holy place. Only the priest could enter the holy place. and did so every night and day to offer incense and to trim the wicks of the lamps. This is where Zechariah met the angel Gabriel. It's the very first story in the Gospel of Luke when the angel told him he would have, he, to him we'd be born a son who was John the Baptist. Now, in the middle of the holy place was a curtain, a curtain that separated the most sacred of places for the Jewish people, the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest entered the Holy of Holies, and only one day a year on the Day of Atonement, because it was the most, uh, because it was the most holy of places, the high priest had to make sure that he was blameless and unblemished, that all his sins had been forgiven properly before he could enter behind that curtain. Now make a mental note of this curtain because in the Holy of Holies for something special happens to this curtain on the day of Jesus' death. And as I stated earlier, Jesus went to the temple on the Monday, the day after Palm Sunday. It's, that's not really apparent from the story in the Gospel of Luke, but that timetable is evident in the, in the Gospel of Mark, his version of the Palm Sunday story. So let's read in chat Mark chapter 11 where it says, on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So it says here on Palm Sunday, he was in Jerusalem. He went to the temple, but he just looked around and saw what was going on. The next day, he went to the temple again, and this is what happened. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So, as I said earlier, this was the season of Passover, where the faithful Hebrew people would come to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins. And only unblemished animals would be properly used for sacrifices. Many came from miles and miles around to come to the temple. So it really wasn't practical to bring a sacrificial animal with them. The plus there's always a danger. They get it to the temple, they show it to the priest, and the priest finds a flaw in it. I'm sorry, this is not appropriate for a sacrificial animal. So, just to make it handy, there were vendors in the courtyard selling pure, proper, suitable sacrificial animals. And so once you're on the temple grounds, there was no other supply of suitable animals to get. So you can imagine the prices were pretty steep, wouldn't they be? I call it the airport principle, right? <laughs> you get to the airport, you're hungry, all you got to eat those restaurants in the, or in the airport where everything is twice or three times the price of what normally is. So there's no other place to go. So you dish out the big bucks. So here they are in the temple. The animals were offered for sale at an inflated price. In many cases, priests got a little kickback on it, on those prices. So the problem was that precisely that animals were being sold at the temple but that the vendors and the priests were making a hefty profit on the trade. So Jesus walks into the temple on that Monday. He looks around at what was going on in the courtyard. Now, as you say, this, what he did on, on, on that Monday was not an impulsive act of rage. It's almost like he had this planned. He wanted to make a point. Remember, we read that in Mark that Jesus went there the night before and saw what was going on. So, but because it was late, he went home. Jesus knew what he had to do. It was a deliberate act on Monday after Palm Sunday. He was making a statement to get everybody's attention. Let's re read uh, the Gospel of Mark. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. So he comes in. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who are selling the doves and won't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the courts. 
and then he yelled out, Is it not written? My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Probably startling to them to hear Jesus yell. You're probably startled to hear me yell, right? In fact, I think I startled myself. Hang on, I collect myself. <sighs> okay. And, you know, he says, it is written. It is written. So he's quoting two, a couple of passages in, in the Old Testament from the Hebrew prophets that are keys to understanding what Jesus was mad about. The first was in the 56th chapter of, of uh, Isaiah. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the temple is a house of prayer, says so with the prophet Isaiah. So what was happening that Jesus saw? The court of the Gentiles was being overrun by vendors and money changers. It was a veritable flea market that, for one, it made it very practically difficult to physically to get through where you need to go to to have the animal sacrifice, to get forgiveness of sins, to enter the temple. And you can only imagine for people who are outside the, 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 the uh, nation of Israel that they become very disillusioned as they walked into the temple. They wanted to worship God of the temple. And all they saw were people trying to make profit. That was their first impression. That was their first impulse. Then Jesus uses a phrase that's very intriguing. He said... You have turned this place into a den of robbers. He is quoting from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 7. A den of robbers is the place to which robbers, after they'd done their dirty deed and rob whoever they had, they would run to hide. Run to hide. So in essence, Jesus is saying that people were using the temple not as it was intended, as Isaiah wrote, a house of prayer, a house of worship, but a place to run to and cover up for the sin and the hypocrisy in their lives. They figured they could do anything they wanted to outside the temple, and they could run to the temple and hide behind their presumed piety and, and righteousness. And their attitude was, I'm righteous and holy, I'm okay. I didn't do anything wrong. I go to the temple. Can't you see? Both Isaiah and Jeremiah had warned the people that one's presence in the physical temple was no guarantee of having a right relationship with God. Yet it's how one acted outside the temple, actions that showed the condition of the heart that was the key. There's a book that came out about 35 years ago, which I must confess, I didn't really care for it, but I love the title. It's called, Who Are You When No One Is Looking? Who are you when no one is looking? That's a soul-searching question for all of us. Are we a different person when we're in the eyes of everybody than we are when we're not? In our innermost character, are our lives filled with those works of the flesh, acts of the flesh that the Apostle Paul names in Galatians 5? Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and even envy. Are there parts of our lives that we don't want people to know about? that fall in the category of dishonesty, corruption, immoral behavior, sinfulness. Yet, we can hide all this behind our religious facade. We know the right words to say. We know the right places to go. We know where to be seen. We know what to post on Facebook so people will know that, will believe that we are righteous to the point that we believe it ourselves. Just like the people in the temple who had turned the temple from a house of prayer into a den of robbers, a place where they hide their sin and hypocrisy behind a religious front. When Jesus rode into the Jerusalem on a donkey on the very first Palm Sunday, he came to expose the hypocrisy in the world. As we come closer to Jesus ourselves in our relationship, he exposes the hypocrisy that lies deep within us. But the good news, Jesus doesn't leave us there. As Jesus cleansed the temple on that Monday of Holy Week, he can take us, our temples, our hearts, our souls, and cleanse them. Eliminate all the hypocrisy and all the ugliness in the lives and give us a new heart. 
the temple in Jerusalem was never the same after Jesus cleansed it of its ugliness and of its hypocrisy. All, if we are truly honest with ourselves and look at our own ugliness and hypocrisy, if we confess what we're doing wrong, the stains and blemishes in our inner core, our outward unchristlike behavior and attitudes, then Jesus can cleanse our temples, our hearts, our souls. And we will truly never be the same again. Let's take a moment to reflect on these words, to examine our own lives, to find out where we may be hiding behind some religious facade, things that we need to confess to Christ who gives us the forgiveness of our sins. Let's, let's take a time to ponder this, reflect on this. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that during this Holy Week we were reminded that you sent Christ to be with us, to forgive us of our sins, not to condemn us, not to judge us, but to show where we fall short, but not leave us there, to forgive us and cleanse us and make new temples out of us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.